her PhD from the University of Missouri. She's a postdoc at Oklahoma State and Cornell University and is currently assistant professor at Southern Illinois University, where she studies ecological and behavioral variation of rodents and urban gradients. I had the great pleasure of meeting Danielle back in 2016 here on the U of I UC campus, where she was presenting as part of the 21st Century Scientists Working Group event. Uh, she provided a workshop there on broadening participation in science, and I would say definitely stood out as the most inspiring speaker. Uh, so when this series started, immediately that was who I recommended that we bring on board. Uh, Danielle is also a TED Fellow and speaker with two hugely popular talks that have been viewed millions of times, one on finding landmines using giant pouch rodents and how hip hop helps you understand science. She is moreover though, a world renowned science communicator who has been involved in countless outreach efforts via blogging, tweeting, speaking, and much more to promote and foster diversity in the sciences. So we're very happy today to be joined by Dr. Danielle Lee. Wow, thank you so much. I'm so honored. Thank you for remembering me. I appreciate that. Um, I'm happy to be back, even though it's in virtual space at U of I, I enjoy time here. I actually have a connection here when I was doing my PhD work, uh, U of I campus was my field site where I collected rodents, voles. You hear me? I'm going to talk about rodents. So I hope you're not squeamish about rodents because that's my jam. All right. I'm going to dive in. All right. So as was mentioned, um, I'm known for my work with the giant pouch rats. Um, and by giant, they can get up to about two feet, two to three feet from nose to tip of tail. This particular species is the southern giant pouched rat I study in Tanzania. And as was mentioned, I'm known for, I've talked about the pouched rats. Uh, my very first TED talk was talking about the research I do with them. Why do I study pouched rats? Because they save lives. Um, they are, you perhaps may have heard the recent news about the pouch rat that won the gold medal for saving lives, Magaiwa. Um, it was reported in NPR and the New York Times, LA Times, Washington Post, everywhere. This hero rat has been trained to detect the explosive explosives and was awarded the PDSA gold medal um, for its bravery for searching out unexploded landmines in Cambodia. And he passed away just about a month and some change ago. So he lived a nice little long life of eight years, which is about the life expectancy of these remarkable rodents, especially in captivity. Now, how I came to study them was during my postdoc years at Oklahoma State in Cornell, when I joined a neuroethology lab. So Alexander Ophir's lab now at Cornell to examine the behavior of these pouch rats. Um, there's a nonprofit in Tanzania that successfully trains them. So that's the organization that deployed them to uh, Magawa to Cambodia. And they use operant conditioning to detect and alert trainers if they've sniffed the TNT chemical signature. So what, what's in dynamite? Now that research, my postdoc research was funded by the US Department of Defense because they were very interested in this project. And I was there to try to suss out the basic biology and behavior of this rodent because that wasn't very well known, not even by the organization that had successfully uh, trained them. But they were still struggling with their breeding programs and even with their success rate. So only about 35% of the animals were successfully able to be successfully trained from once they were bred in captivity to, you know, graduating, you know, to that. So that's that's a lot of trial and error. And they had been at it by the time I visited, they had been at it for 10, 12 years and they were still, they were still getting lucky, but there wasn't any reliability or dependability. And that's when I'm realizing, you know what? Basic biology is the solution. That's the gap. Now, when I'm in Tanzania, both then and now, I'm hosted by the local university, Sokowini University of Agriculture. And when I came to the neuro this neuroethology group, I came with this very strong background in ethology and natural history, as well as my personal background in science outreach and public engagement in the sciences. And so what I tend to do compared to many of my colleagues in most traditional science, I mean, science trademark spaces, is that because I don't look or sound or move like most of my colleagues here in the States, I really approach science differently, mainly because people approach me differently. This packaging matters. 
But I experienced something interesting and remarkable in Tanzania. I got to experience and embed myself with researchers who, although I was different than them too, uh, but just on the surface, I wasn't that different. So I was no longer what I call the lonely only black person on the science team, especially in leadership. So there were graduate students in our labs, but as far as at the PhD level, as far as I can tell, I was the first PhD scientist, a uh, black PhD to walk the halls in the zoology department at Oklahoma State. Um, and at Cornell, that wasn't necessarily true, but there were only two black people the entire time I was there in the department of psychology, me and then the graduate student in the lab. Um, and so being in Tanzania, being at Sokowini University of Agriculture in Tanzania with those colleagues, I was in a place and space where black scientific expertise was the norm and expected. In other words, I was centering myself for the very first, very first time in my professional career where black spaces were also science spaces. And that's one of the things, even though I'm not gonna talk about it a whole lot here, that's something I talk about and I advocate about and I approach my science now that I do uh, urban ecology closer to home, it's just looking at black and brown spaces as scientifically viable spaces where we center the experiences of the people who are there, not just simply parachuting in, getting the data and leaving, but like respecting the entire ecosystem of places where people live, but then they also have this value that's of scientific import. All right. So this is Morogoro, Tanzania, an area of view. This is where I study the pouched rats. And you'll note, if you look at the top of the frame, you see the beautiful Uluguru Mountains. That's the most beautiful and best morning sun uh, thing to see every morning. I miss it so much. Uh, but I want you to note that there's an urban to rural gradient as I, you know, from the mountains to the city where you see lots of buildings, but it's still little trees everywhere, all the way out to this rural area. So taking a closer look, this is when I first started doing research in Tanzania. This was my primary research site during my first trips, the rural area, the Shamba uh, in Swahili. And so I, you know, this is agriculture university, so that's not hard. Those are crops and all, but it's still part of the university wider community. And that's why I was doing capture mark recapture studies. I was catching animals. I was trying to figure out where they were living and setting up grids to see if I could at least follow one little, you know, group at least consistently, you know, just catch everybody, census everybody, and then try to keep track of them as long as possible. And then in my later years, and now, and, and also now, this is where I study pouch rats. I also study pouch rats there, but also now here in the town. So this is still Morogoro. And this particular neighborhood is called Tawala. This is a working class neighborhood of Morogoro where my trusted research tech lives. So Mr. Shabani Lutea. So first things first, Shabani Lutea is the world's authority on giant pouch rats. Everything I know and I'm credited for, uh, for pouch rats, this gentleman uh, taught me. So I really appreciate him. He's an amazing person. So in this frame, I'm taking morphometrics. So I'm measuring the pouch rat, um, like taking measurements like foot length and body weight and ear length. So that's, for those of us in natural history, this is just kind of our go-to data that we catch. You catch animal, you wanna catch it, get as much basic data on their, on their size and their morphometrics as possible. Uh, and, and here that you don't see the rat because we're holding it inside this very specially made pouch to safely handle the pouch rats made of this rip resistant sailing fabric. Uh, that's to protect them and me. Um, and here's where my experiences in Tanzania with the pouch rats come to play in really cementing me in my science and my philosophy um, and in even shaping how I train students. I learned from Shabani that all of the pouch rats that were in the landmine detection training program were pouchies, that's what I call them, panyabuku, that he retrieved from his neighborhood. So yeah, this very same neighborhood, the MG, not the Shamba where I was catching and studying in panyabuku, but in this very built up environment. So, and like I said, it was working class. So it was a lot of people there. Um, there was structures of various strengths, you know, so some, 10 metals, some stronger than others, 
some places with a lot of mud kind of thatched together walls. It was a little bit of everything. So lots of people, lots of structures, lots of piles of trash because they were burning trash and food from just various sources, whether it was the businesses or the pantries from chicken coops. And I started thinking, I was like, wait a minute, could this explain all that, those variable responses that the trainers at the, at the training facility were getting from animals, you know, from their breeding and training? They, these were all problem rats. They had created a landmine detection program from problem rodents. They were all nuisance rodents. And they were rodents that had been caught and removed from this, from people's homes, like literally in, in one of these houses that you see here, or at best sold to the organization uh, because because they offer bounties. They go through periods where they offer bounties for people to bring in pouch rats. You know, no questions asked about where they came from, any of that stuff. And so, yeah, all the animals were a bit wild and hard to tame. But there was also something about them that was like super nimble and smart and clever, but it was all over the place. You know what I mean? And so I really began to rethink my scientific purpose and role there. So yeah, I came there to like really figure out this great natural history question because we don't get a lot of those funded opportunities anymore in natural history. But I really, really started taking from my comprehension of an anthropological approach. In other words, I found myself embedded in my research, not just simply there observing it on the outside. I'd actually live in, in this community for weeks, months at a time. And after a while, when I realized where these rodents were coming from, when I was, because I'm a capture release person, it's not the same to catch a rat in the wild or even out in the Shamba and release it again. I'm now asking, can I re-release a rat back into your house or in something that's gonna come back in your house. And that just started sitting funny with me. Sure, it's great to say I'm studying this rodent that can save lives all over the world, but what, what did that have to do with the people of Umtawala who were really like getting rid of this rodent? It's disturbing me. And I started to wonder when or how could this research be of use to them besides just simply feeling good that they contributed to this really great, you know, national hero story. Um, and all the while, let's also keep in mind, there's the nonprofit that trains the org the change the rat. This is a European run, operated and funded organization. They get all the credit. And the local Tanzanian trainers and laborers, not even counting just these regular everyday people in Tawala where these rats came from, get nothing. And meanwhile, they were earning even the even the most even the most highly even the most highly respected trainers and supervisors were making less in a month that I could withdraw from the ATM. So I began to think I was like, nope, the research I do has to matter now, and it has to matter to everybody, especially these people on the ground, especially the residents of Tawala, where these rats are coming from. These rats were vexing them. When were they going to finally get some information to help them figure out what's going on or that could be a benefit that they could use to advocate for whatever they needed it for? And so I really start thinking about how my research matters on multiple scales. And I apply those lessons now here at home in the St. Louis metro area. Um, I still go back to Tanzania. I don't get back as frequently as I as I would like to, of course. But there's also it's still the same notion of studying these rodents right outside your back door. And we have this great rural urban gradient right here. And it gives me the opportunity to really test out ideas um, at a smaller scale before I take them all the way to Tanzania where it costs me more. I really need them to work. I don't get a lot of, I don't have second chances to tweak and figure it out. So I really appreciate the opportunity to continue working in rodents that I've worked with before, which are field mice, but then really kind of working out some of the mechanics and then applying it to a different scale, a larger scale. Like in Tanzania, I continue to work with others most notably my students. So these are some of my amazing undergraduate students in my lab. 
And I also have on occasion to work with folks in the communities that I study. For example, here are students from the East St. Louis Upward Bound program. And here it is, I'm, we're searching for research sites near their campus. So in, in uh, so St. East St. Louis and inner city uh, might be defined as a shrinking city uh, for some. And in this frame, I'm training them in natural history observation and description of field sites, All right? Now, the lab, we study uh, various field mice species. So paramiscus, voles, jumping mice, house mice. My rule is if it's a mouse and it ends up in my trap, I study it. All right. So now let's think about it this way. He caught, so, now, so now I just want to prepare you for it. So now I'm putting my traditional uh, biologist hat on. Ecologists and evolutionary biologists have been cataloging and studying phenotypic differences between populations along gradients, between habitats, and across distribution ranges for decades. That's kind of our jam. We know that, they, that there are these incredible phenotypic differences within a species that occupy different habitats. For example, prairie voles. This is a, a, a field mouse species that lives throughout this region. Um, studies of prairie voles, Microtus ochrogaster, um, have demonstrated that depending on where the prairie voles come from, you can see striking phenotypic differences in the same species. So for example, stock, uh, so animals that were raised in these colonies and studied for parenting studies, behavior studies. So we use, prairie voles have now become a model species for studying family dynamics, uh, parent offspring dynamics, um, um, mating system um, observations. And so stock, so colonies that come from um, either Illinois, most notably Urbana-Champaign, because that is kind of the center of prairie voles right there, um, have supported the assumption that the species is monogamous. They're a cooperative breeder. And while the other studies of prairie voles from Kansas, a more arid habitat, have called into assumption this question. So in other words, if you had mice feel uh, prairie voles and your stock came from uh, Kansas, usually the Lawrence, Kansas area, you're like, no, they're not, they're barely monogamous at all. They, they have a lower preference for their, even for their familiar mate. Well, studies have shown, so follow-up studies have demonstrated that there are some notable phenotypic differences that contribute to genetic mating differences, which is there's greater sexual size dimorphism in Kansas prairie voles compared to Illinois prairie voles. Like we said before, there's a difference in their partner preferences and parental contact behavior. Um, both the Illinois and Vol Kansas voles will show preference for their partner, but it's stronger in the Illinois, in the Illinois voles. Um, even allo parenting, so that means showing parent-like behavior for young that's not your own. So older siblings will stick around and hang out. So they see weaker allo parenting and even weaker social behavior among non-related conspecifics from animals that come from Kansas versus those that come in Illinois. The Illinois voles are, prairie voles are essentially like, they're like little hippies. They just love each other. They wander around and hang out and spend the night in different, different little uh, nests over a period of time until they eventually find their own. So on their, while they're dispersing and gaining independence, they just kind of hang out and meet all kinds of individuals. And there's no huge overt aggression that we see compared to the Kansas vole. And so and one of the questions, let me get to this. So and the question is, so what's leading to this? It's about these kind of these habitat differences. Spatial structuring of vegetation between the sites contribute to this between species, I mean within species or interspecific variation in the social and genetic mating patterns of the species. That's because space use is often related to the mating system. Streetfield et al. found that space use 
and overlap with members of the same and opposite sex were best explained by the effects of the site and sex. In other words, where they found the animals and the sex of the subject. The relative strength of social associations with opposite sex conspecifics was best predicted by where they found the animals, so site, the density at that place, and, and sex as well. And so the genetic mating system was best explained by these population densities. And so we see that these extrinsic variables related to environmental space and place that the voles occupied affected these differences in their social and genetic mating systems, um, systems between populations. I'm simply, I'm, so I'm doing what ecologists and evolutionary biologists before me have always done. We're just comparing things across these scales or across these gradients. I'm just simply narrowing the scale of observation, looking at a species across environmental gradients that we might be more familiar with. So this human built up environment. Although I focus on examining <clears throat> differences in behavior and ecology and natural history of city and country mice, and pouch rats. Uh, we know that this phenomena of urban rural differences um, exist across a variety of taxa, coyote, deer, raccoons, songbirds, even raptors. That's because land management creates gradients. Commensal species like pouch rats and field mice species like the paramiscus and the voles, these are all regarded in different places as nuisance rodents. And what's remarkable about these rodents that can be a nuisance to us is they, they have this ability to live and thrive across a continuum of natural to human modified landscape gradients. Land management is the process of managing the use and development of land over space, place, and time. And it happens in both urban and rural settings, but usually when we mention it, we tend to have urban places top of mind. So we think of how we manage land resources in more urbanized places. Now, I'm still submitting a lot of my ideas, but what I focus on, but what I focus on is happening from this perspective of the subject. And I like to think about these different places and spaces that these nuisance rodents occupy from the perspective of how are these habitats disturbed? What supplements are they getting from their, either their habitat or the surrounding areas around these habitats or these field sites? And then how does what we do, in other words, how we build or modify the environment, how does it disrupt or create barriers for dispersal? So that's what I, I'm thinking about as I'm moving to finding these connections between these nuisance rodents ecology, nuisance rodent uh, ecology framework. So here are some of my local field research sites. So on the campus of SIUE, uh, it's a 2,600 acres, land, acres of land. Uh, it's huge. It's the second largest in, uh, in acreage uh, university campus in the States. Only Annapolis is bigger. Um, the buildings are mostly clustered together with much of the acreage of the university in nature preserve and land management. Now, where you see the star, that's my research building. That's the science building. And over here, that's the field site with our little modest field station and some gravel roads. And this is where I have some semi-permanent trapping grids. So I go out there on a regular basis and I can put traps out. And for the most part, I catch something. And I'm also still trapping around the university. So Edwardsville is what we would call um, a small city. All right, 12 miles away from campus in this very rural town is Marine, Illinois. This is another place. So this is your average little country town, just 12 miles away from campus. And here's another one of my field research sites where we, for, uh, for a year or two, we actually put out uh, a temporary grid trapping uh, mice across both that, what you see, it looks like a mowed area and then the wooded area. And so in that particular property, they're not growing crops anymore. They're just letting it grow. Then this is another example on the outskirts of town, 15 miles from campus. You see this very mosaic environment from this aerial image. 
But a lot of this is what we would call mostly unmanaged forested land. So this is what approximates that natural kind of setup with the animals being evaluated across both from that forested region to that mode region. Again, this is private property where they're not growing crops, they're just simply letting things grow and they, and they mow maybe once or twice a year, just like the previous property. And then here's another spot. This is really close to campus, only three and a half miles away uh, by the Mississippi River. So to the left of that frame, that is the Mississippi River, that is not land. Um, and this is land managed by the Army Corps of Engineer, and it includes where I trap mice, a 15 year restored prairie right along the Mississippi River floodplain. And different plot parts of, the, of this managed land contains restored prairies anywhere from 15 to 30 years of age, but this particular spot where I trap is a 15 year restored prairie. All right, let's get into it. All right, so the pouch rat research. So I do capture mark release studies. And in this case, looking at across rural to what we might define as roughly suburban sites in the more rural region. Um, I was back and forth in Tanzania over a, a, a three year period. Um, so intense on season trapping for two to three months when I would be in the country in our summer. So it was their cool season. So not dry, it was just after the rainy season. I learned the hard way. I don't like being there during the height of the rainy season and you can't catch anything. So two to three, two to three months of, of intense trapping. So going out three to five days a week, every week uh, while I was there. And then once I departed, my collaborators would follow by doing roughly monthly off season trapping. So once a month, so one week in a month. And so over this multi-year uh process, we, we catalog about 4,100 trap nights, and we made 127 captures. Uh, and what we found is that we would catch, so number of times we caught males versus females, we caught females more often than males, especially in the Shamba or the agricultural or the rural area. And so in that rural site, um, you'll catch a, a female repeatedly, males less so. And even though it's not reflected here in this data, when I take a look at the data, when I recapture males, they were all small size males, which are coded as juveniles. Once they reached about 1.2 kg, which is mature size, I'm not likely to catch them with any frequency, like in, uh, any dependable frequency. But females, I could catch females repeatedly night after night. And here in the peri-urban region, so Chuakuku, that's the university. Uh, so in the university area, again, we will catch females a bit more often than males. But looking at these sex differences, so we do have sex differences in recapture. So T-test, so looking at a T-test of 0 0.07, we are more likely to not just catch females again, but their repeatability is much, much higher than males, which followed what, what I was seeing in the data before running it is that I was catching the same female, like literally night after night after night. But if, if I caught a big male, at best, I'd find him again a month, two months later. And sometimes he wouldn't come this way again. Now, taking a look at the white-footed mice, and this is based on research from my master's student. So her master's project, looking at foraging activity of paramiscus over preferred and non-preferred habitat. So paramiscus are this really amazing mice. They actually can live almost anywhere. You can find them most anywhere, but they do prefer forested areas. And so we caught these in that rural area where, um, where there was land, where there was old fields. And then what was happening is there was an old field right up next to a forest. And so instead of doing capture mark recapture this time, my student came up with this ingenious way of recording their behavior and their activity by creating these bucket traps. So it's a bucket with two holes cut at the bottom. So entry holes where only small things can get in and out of. So an elimination trap essentially. And it was an open arena bucket with a trail camera mounted to the top. And then trail cameras come on whenever they sense uh, 
motion and then it would just automatically video record. And she did this project from fall 19 until winter 2020. And we were able to catalog over 151 camera trap events. So that means how many bucket camera nights we put them out there. It's because we put multiple buckets uh, in the habitat over multiple nights. And so what we found is that there is an effective time of day on visitation rate. In other words, paramiscids are more active at night. This wouldn't surprise many of us because we think of these rodents as nocturnal, though we had a few daytime visits but they were mostly busy in the night. But if you look very closely, they, they were really, really, really super active during dusk. Like dusk was their jam. Dusk and uh, dusk was their jam. All right, and so, and then paramiscus visiting the foraging station of each microhabitat. Now, this wasn't significant, um, but it does demonstrate that if we look at the edge, so there was an edge where there was a mold area between the forest and the, and the overgrown old field. And so that's what the edge represents. And so looking at it that way, it kind of really blurs a lot of it out, even though there's this Visually, you see a trend that they, they spent more time in the grass than the forest habitat. But what we noticed was that animals were just spending, they were, they were active, they were out there. Um, even though I'm not reflecting it here, some of the preliminary analysis looks at uh, animals in the forest will come out earlier in the day. In other words, they came out more at dusk and then the animals in the grass were coming out closer to midnight. So they're coming out later in the day. Uh, but we're in the process of really reevaluating a lot of the data and getting it ready for publication. Now let's take a look at this, the, our bigger study looking at kind of field mice of all these various species. And so this is a capture mark release study over three different environmental gradients. So looking at old fields, which is just simply overgrown fields, just kind of left on its own. So essentially a fallow field, a brown field. Now a brown field, it's also just simply an overgrown field, but what makes it a brown field is that historically, it had some human development on it or some human um, deep modification or harm to the soil. And so that's what it means. So brown fields include super fun sites. <laughs> it would include anything like something that used to be a parking lot and now it's grown over. So that's a brown field versus an old field is it was always, uh, a soil field and now it's no longer being growing crops anymore and it's just kind of growing on its own. Um, both old fields and brown fields tend to have a lot of invasives so it's a mix of invasives and natives and unless it's properly managed the invasive species of vegetation will completely take over. And then restored prairie um, which is as it sounds it's an area of land that's being managed to resemble historical um, vegetation patterns. And so looking at these gradients, but with different surrounding areas, so whether they were rural or peri-urban around them. Um, this data was collected from 2017 to 2019. Um, and it was, I'm sorry, it was active trapping. So it was active trapping from mid-March to late September. Um, and what we did was we were rotating between field sites. So not every field site had the exact same trapping effort. So just to let you know. Um, and there were approximately 3,800 trap nights and 189 catches. And actually, my students right now are actually going through and really kind of going through a fine tooth comb and looking at what was happening with each of those trap nights at each of those locations. All right. So here's some of the preliminary capture mark release data from looking at this larger data set. And so what we find is that the old fields, so spread across three different sites, but those fields that would be defined as old fields, so overgrown, not really managed, but the soil is pretty much still okay. It hasn't been disturbed, at least in any known history. We're seeing that we get more field mice catches in the old field compared to the brown field or the restored prairie. Um, and if you think about what's, if you scale up, in other words, let's now take a, let's take that area of view and go up. Well, what's surrounding that area? So like not just simply an old field or 
a brownfield or a restored prairie, but what's around it? Like what's the environmental abiotic body conditioning around it? Well, some things are surrounded by rural areas and some are peri-urban. So in other words, there's some built up things around it, whether it's industry or the university or roads, we find that rural area, so in other words, it's a lot less of that, what we call from that green to gray ratio space. There's a lot more green space around it. That does, it looks like there's a trend that suggests that not only is it more catches in old fields, but just places in general that are surrounded by rural areas is where we are more likely to catch more field mice. Now let's focus specifically on voles. So the types of field mice, I would break them down into voles, paramiscus. Yes, there are multiple species of paramiscus, but the truth is only God knows the difference. And uh, jumping mice. So let's just focus on voles. Uh, around here we have prairie voles, though on paper, we, we the books suggest that we might have southern bog lemmings around. Uh, I haven't haven't found anything that I'm certain is a southern bog lemming yet. Uh, but again, voles are really loving these restored prairies. That's where I'm more likely to catch uh, that restored prairie. So in this case, that Army Corps of Engineering land, it was a vole paradise. I caught a few voles on the SIUE campus land, but where they really thrive, where we caught them in abundance, was at the restored prairie. And the paramiscus, they seem to really be caught more frequently at old fields. So in this case, it was the old fields that were both on SIUE campus and surrounded at their rural site. We didn't find any, like we, we didn't catch any at the restored prairie at all. And an interesting story is happening here with jumping mice. So first of all, jumping mice are really, really small little, they're small and very, very delicate, but mean. Um, they have really large feet, and as the name suggests, like they're really good jumpers. You got a little guy that's the can literally can be the size of your thumb, roughly the size of your thumb, and he can he or she they can jump up to about two and a half feet. So they can completely jump out of my apparatuses if I don't put a top on them uh, when I'm trying to do behavioral observations. We only found them in the brownfield, so on campus, and and even though it's not reflected here they seem to be really, really sensitive to disturbance. So like our university mows the fields once a, once a year and they'll mow them again in the summer if we ask for it. And what I learned is that the year I asked them to mow in the summer, we just lost those jumping mice, couldn't find them again. Um, and they liked it there, but more importantly, they really like specific places in the in that brown field. So it wasn't the whole brown field that they liked. They liked the brown field near the back where all the grass was super, super tall, where there was lots of different varieties of the, uh, vegetation. Um, and they seem to be, uh, there was also ethereal ponds nearby. All right. So bringing it all together, so the connections. So even though I'm studying really large RUSs all the way down to the small little beasties, what we're finding is that, you know, this preliminary information is demonstrating that animals have these, spa these spatial use, spatial preference and use patterns. What we're seeing in the pouchies is that we're seeing these sex differences in recapture. That we're more likely to recapture females reliably over consecutive nights, repeatedly in the same place compared to males. There's more time in between when we catch a male, if we catch them again. In field mice, because we're looking at different species, we're noticing that some species are caught more often in certain places. So there's, again, this kind of space place preference. And that's, eco and that's ecologically defined because different species will occupy specific places and spaces over the observed time period because they're getting what different things that they need from them. So it's something attractive about those places. These space use patterns make sense if you think about the natural history and the life history traits of the species. So let's think about pouch rats. Their site fidelity. Pouch rats live underground in these huge dens. Females, from, from what I'm hearing from local ecological knowledge, is that small, small pouches, so in other words, baby pouches, are really rarely seen above ground. Even Shabani, who's been catching uh, pouch rats for 20, 30 years, he never catches a pouched rat less than a, less than a kilogram. He just doesn't. 
So something about combining both this traditional ecological knowledge and what we're seeing and uh, empirical data is that they stay underground for a while. Mamas come out, they gather all this food, they're called pouch rats because they have cheek pouches and then they stay underground. So there's a fidelity there. It looks like these males may be roamers and they're roaming from place to place to place in hopes of what we're guessing is finding a female that's an estrus, um, which that's another thing that needs to be sussed out. Even though there's a breeding program for the pouch rats, they're not, they're not, they don't know if they're uh, induced ovulators or not. That would make, are they induced ovulators or do they have a cycle? That part is still not certain. Uh, from what I'm looking at, I think that there's, they cycle, but their cycle can be really, really variable. And one of the reasons I've had a hard time understanding what that cycle could be, and so here's where perspective matters, is because my comprehension of seasonality is very different than what's happening in Tanzania. They have wet, dry cycles. I'm used to temporal cycles that's based on summer, winter, spring, fall. They don't think like that. Their seasons aren't related to that. And I have a hard time translating the knowledge they're giving me in a way that makes sense to me. And so that's a translation error, not only in language, but in culture and in scientific, uh, uh, where I'm seated scientifically, I'm seated just in a very different cultural geographic context than my scientist colleagues in Tanzania. So finding a way to kind of bring that information together so that then we can properly describe the seasonality, if there is, of these pouch rats. White-footed mice, uh, that's the paramiscus, they can occupy most types of habitat. And we found them throughout the study area, but we found using the bucket traps that they're more active at night and in forest, forested habitats. So in other words, the forested habitats is where they would come out earlier and they would come out at night and they seem to get a jump on it earlier than the white-footed mice that lived in the less preferred grassy habitat. Prairie voles can occupy many types of habitat as well, but they're found more often in open grasslands with low disturbance frequencies. So those restored prairies, parts of those old fields where they weren't being mowed very frequently. And jumping mice, super, super sensitive species. This is a mouse I actually don't expect to find in urban centers once I start getting deep into inner city areas. I don't expect to find them at all. They seem to be amazingly sensitive to disturbance. Um, and what we're finding uh, is that they're found only in these riparian grass areas with very tall grasses and forbs and lots of vegetative biodiversity that experience super low disturbance intensities and frequencies, All right? All right. What I hope you get out of this, especially many of you coming from the genomic side of you, is why does any of this matter? Well, I was originally, you know, doing the pouch rat stuff, hoping that what I did would contribute to helping them understand potentially these you know, hereditary patterns, which can lead to understanding genomics that could be used for prediction or identifying which pouch rats could be trained more easily or properly or had a, a propensity for training. Um, but we're learning like a lot of things, that's a little hard to do, not because it's hard to do, it's because historically we have our fundamental science that's done first and then we have applied science. With the pouch rats, it was a case of where we did the ap application before we did the basic. That's not historically how innovation has happened in science. Um, and so foundation, you know, is natural history matters because it is the foundation to any applied science, to any time we use innovation uh, to apply science. And I also like to remind my colleagues, so this is what I often did in my lab meetings when I interact with folks, is that the animals that we study have these deep evolutionary and ecological histories that shape them. So that's part of their inheritance they come to the table with. Even though there's things happening right now and they're responding to it, and especially when we look at rodents, which are amazingly gentle species, they're really good at surviving no matter what. Uh, what I love about nuisance rodents is that they've demonstrated across human time or across human culture and across geography, time, space, and place that they're not going anywhere, that they are a part of our human story, that there's never been a culture, there's never been a place, there's never been a time that hasn't been vexed by rodents. 
And so, and in some parts of our history, we've been able to use them for our innovation, but they still come to the table with these evolutionary ecological histories. Um, and it influences our sciences because depending on the science that you do, we've seen, we've heard these stories over time that some labs like having a hard time, like I can't get this model to act right. And sometimes it comes down to you're asking the wrong question of that model. You know, like for example, like if you're, if you want to do a study that looks at, you know, response to, you know, locomotion versus swimming. Well, we got swimming rats out there. Don't pick a desert rat to study swimming locomotion or, you know, don't pick a rat, don't pick a mouse that isn't particularly known for climbing. So I think of the voles to look at how they escape in three-dimensional space. You would do better using a paramiscus to ride because paramiscus are amazing climbers and they're also pretty good swimmers too. So in other words, this natural history is the bedrock to our science, whether it's in the future, whether how we innovate, or even just the basic questions that we ask. I like to remind people that, you know, phenotype equals genotype plus environment. And so we hyper-focus on these phenotypes and those genotypes are critically important because that was the black box for forever. But that environmental component is still, still there. Like, don't forget about me. I don't go anywhere. And natural history is just this opportunity to remind us of how not to be afraid to get dirty. I mean, and I think that's one of the things that I really like about being an ethologist. I'm very comfortable with that uncertainty. I'm very comfortable with that kind of potential messiness and uncleanliness and uh, things not necessarily turning out the way I thought they would be. Because in ecology, you know, the answer to every ecological question is, it depends. Uh, <laughs> and that may not be comfortable. I found that my colleagues who work in more, you know, in, in the genomic side or developmental side are really sussing out those details that that can really be tangly and frustrating for them. But there's a lot of beauty there. There's a lot there. And in learning how to navigate that discomfort to find some amazing, you know, hypotheses to explore is that's where that's my jam. I get excited by that. And with that, I want to wrap it up. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much to all the uh, my colleagues. So Alex Ophir Lab. So that's where I started with the pouch rate stuff and research lab there. Aubrey Kelly, my colleague, when I was there doing a postdoc, she now hyper-focuses. She does a lot of neuro uh, neuroscience. Marissa Rice, also a neuroscientist. And she also helped with uh, some of the graphs. She's also my developing editor. So I love, I, so I, I recommend that to everyone, get your developing editor, as well as my colleagues at Sokolini University, my amazing students, and my department. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. We really, really appreciate it. Um, it was such a beautiful talk. Everybody, oh, round you. of applause, round of applause, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have time to take a few questions? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we have one right, right in the chat automatically. Um, thank you for your stimulating talk. Do you know of any efforts to sequence the genomes of Illinois and Kansas prairie voles? I do know that prairie voles, I'm pretty sure they've been sequenced. Um, there was when all the big genome projects were going around and then the, the Broad Institute does the 200 mammal thing. I don't know if they're specifically looking at Illinois versus Kansas. I'll be honest, I can't, I don't dive deep into the genomics anymore because I'm not, I'm no longer surrounded by all those great folks. So I don't have that, the benefit of their, their chatter anymore. But I do know the pre genome is being sequenced, but I don't know if there's a difference between Illinois and Kansas, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Dr. Jean Robinson says, you're always welcome here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> people can feel any? free to un unmute themselves to ask question mm -hmm. or put it in the chat and while anyone might gather their thoughts on that i want to throw one out myself which was uh looking at these differences in distributions where you're finding your voles and the white-footed mice and the jumping mice um do you think that's entirely uh preferred resource differences or is there some species specific exclusion once somebody is already established in a zone you know what i don't <sighs> We, ha we can't we haven't tested it yet but that has been inch uh 
that has been kind of getting at us. So for example, in the video recordings of the, in the bucket traps, in that entire study, our capture mark release data, there were voles in the area. Absolutely, not a lot, but there were voles there, but we never caught a vole on camera, never. And it made us wonder if that's the case. Now, right now we got cam bucket cameras out on campus. So on my campus sites, I got buckets out right now as we speak. So if you follow me on Twitter, you saw I posted some pictures from the bucket camera. I, that's, I was excited to see a vole in those because I was beginning to think that the voles were kind of scared off by the buckets. No, we're finding voles in those traps. We're finding voles in the daytime, just hanging out in the daytime. Um, and so far, I'm seeing voles and not seeing paramiscus, even though I know at least historically voles stayed there. I have to start from scratch uh, in my sites because COVID, I have not, I have not caught a vole in over two years because when COVID happened, we weren't allowed to do any field work. So all my data abruptly ends in 2019 and I we're starting all over from scratch this summer. I wonder that. That's kind of an unofficial question we have. So I have a question, uh, super great talk. I laughed out loud so many times, particularly picturing um, prairie voles that look like hippies. <laughs> it's like, I need to see an image of this. <laughs> um, so my question is uh, about citizen science kind of projects. Um, I'm, I never actually looked into this, but is there any sort of involvement with like, you know, people who have these, <laughs> nuisance uh, uh rodents or or what i would call cute roommates <laughs> um that you know you you know you could do like live trapping and then there's some way to like record that and it goes into like a larger database or is there anything that exists like that uh to my knowledge no i do that's also on my i want to do it but i can only do so many things at a time hence <laughs> this is where collaborations come in um i would so i let me start over one of the great things about working with nuisance rodents is that people will volunteer their spaces and homes as research sites. So I spent literally all last week driving throughout um, Metro St. Louis on the Illinois side of people who are like, come, drive on my property. Can you put traps out? Um, so I do, I do some informal citizen science where as people are like, come to my property, you're welcome to come and trap things here. So I'll tell you a dream project I want to do with my students. I would like to set up, since I'm active on social media, set up so that on social media, people can volunteer sightings and pictures of rodents or what even what they think is a rodent because half the time it's a shrew it ain't a rodent <laughs> um but even what they think uh, so like their what I call their catch kills and other sightings and just like just start contributing those sightings and then working with someone who does whatever fancy computer stuff can then we can start pinpointing based on these social media tags or these reports mm -hmm then we can go to those neighborhoods specifically and be like, hey, we heard you're getting a lot of stuff. Can we start trapping to actually see what species are here and how close are they to your house? Because that would be the other, so other little, so I'm literally thinking and talking at the same time. So like cats bring stuff home. Are they bringing it from home or are they going out and bringing it in? You know what I mean? So, right. so all these things, I think there's these really great opportunities for people to participate in very, um, kind of back, you know, not being up close because the average person's like, I don't want to touch a mouse. Mm -hmm. uh, but so far what I do is if people tell me they're having a problem and they give me permission to come, then I'm like, well, if you give me permission, I would like to come and set traps up and, and do that. Or another thing that I can do, I'm thinking also, because I'm bound by all these rules, by these regulations, federal regulations, animal care, if people catch mice and they were destroying them anyway, they can, so if they were, so in other words, if you call Orkin and they took them away anyway, and they were already dead, they were already going to put them down. I can collect some data real fast and then turn them back over to do whatever you're going to do. Mm. You know, then they'll be handled in whatever way they were going to be handled. Mm. And so in that case, it's not that much different than a lot of what I do in Tanzania. I call that approach bounty approach. I don't know if there's a real word for it, but that's just, it's like a bounty animal. So it's like, in, you know, like, can I, can I study that real fast before you throw it away? 
can I take some measurements and get a tissue sample? And yeah. thank you. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'm open to all of it, but for me, the barrier to formalizing that has been time. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. And person and being able to manage like personal administration. Yeah. I can yeah. see that being very complicated. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you. You also have questions for Danielle? I guess just thank you one more time for an amazing talk. We're so glad we could have you join us today. Well, thank you. Hold on. I see someone. Hold on. I saw something in the chat. So I wanted to at least before you, everybody left. Oh, is there? I guess they're gone. Okay. Someone was like, thank you. They, were, they came from Madison, Illinois. So I wanted to say, well, thank you. I'm glad. Shout out your hometown. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank and thank you so much, Danielle. It was great. Thank you.